Hi, I'm Phil Cook, and as you know, pastors have a lot of responsibilities. There's plenty of things for pastors to think about and be doing, but today in the digital age that we live in, I think it's time to start elevating the role of communication and media. I love outreach, I love missions, I love educational programs. However, we can't afford these days to really stop thinking or delegate the role of communication and media to some lower level. We have to make it a priority. So today, I wanna to talk about the five communication priorities I would have if I were a pastor. Hi, I'm Phil Cook, and I really appreciate you coming. You know, uh, we're talking about digital media today, certainly in the role of a church or a ministry, and I've just finished a new book called Maximize Your Influence, how digital media can work for your ministry, your church, and you. The truth is, we live in this media-driven culture today, and I just know that if we don't learn to speak that language, we're going to completely miss this generation of people. So I was thinking the other day about five communication priorities that I would have if I was a pastor. My dad was a pastor, so I grew up in a church working behind the scenes, seeing the challenges and the things that he dealt with every single day. And so I think it's interesting to look and see if I happen to be a pastor today what are the roles I would consider important? How would I elevate communication and media? And what are the five areas that I think would be most important? So if you're a pastor or a ministry leader, write this down. If you're not, send this to a pastor or media leader that you know to help them really understand the power of this digital age that we live in. The five top communication priorities, my five, if I were a pastor. Number one, learn how to lead creative people. I'll tell you, this is a problem I see over and over again in the church today. Leaders of churches, whether they're the pastor or other high-level roles, executive pastor, they just don't know how to lead creative people. They're freaked out by them. In many cases, they just don't understand them. They need to learn how to lead creative people. That's so important today because the creative team around a pastor is the key to multiplying that pastor's message to hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of people out there. Let me give you a few quick tips on number one here on leading creative people that I think are important. You need to create stability. It's interesting that uh, pastors that threaten their team with, hey, if we don't get this done, you're out of a job. Or if we don't get this done, our church will be out of business. You can't threaten a creative team. That doesn't help a creative person. Stability matters. Certainly you can challenge them. Certainly you can inspire them, but they don't respond to threats. And I know so many bosses, even in the ministry today, that lead their creative team simply by threat. And it just simply does not work. And certainly, if you threaten a creative person with being fired, that's the most uninspiring thing in the, in the world. So you're not going to get much out of them. So it's important to understand they need a certain amount of stability. They also need to be safe from excessive criticism. Certainly, I don't mind sitting down with my creative team and talking about the pluses and the minuses and the pros and cons of the work we do, but I never allow excessive criticism. In fact, I fired one client one time because he was so incredibly critical of the social media person we had on the team at the time. And I just don't, I just don't want that in the room. I just do not want that in the room. So make the, make the space safe from excessive criticism. I also encourage you to make sure all of your leaders are on the same page. One of the great challenges with cre being a creative person at church, whether you're a designer, a video person, a web person, whatever, is the pastor will say one thing, but then the executive pastor says something different or some other church leader, a board member, someone else has other opinions and the creative person starts getting this wide range of opinions that very often are in conflict with each other. So before you launch a creative project or share it with your creative team, make sure your upper level leadership is all on the same page. So the, the reactions they're getting, the encouragement they're getting, uh, the, the conversations they're having all reflect the same vision and the same purpose. You don't want to get that kind of conflict going on. I would also say just as another quick thing is, you know what, you can help a creative person get out of his comfort zone with a great challenge. I'll tell you a uh, dirty little secret and that is creative people, um, uh, we love deadlines. You know, most leaders think creative people are, you know, hate deadlines. But the truth is, 
I love them because they give me a boundary. They give me an understanding of where I am with the project. In fact, I, I don't, I have to say, I don't even start a creative project until I see the deadline and, you know, looming in the distance. Uh, it's like taking off in a plane. I don't really do lift off until I see the end of the runway coming up fast. There's a great quote out there I've talked about on this blog before, on my blog before. Um, I love deadlines. I love the whooshing sound they make as they fly by. The, the truth is missing deadlines is no fun. And we don't do that. We don't do that at our company at Cook Media Group and I know great creative people don't, but it is important to share a deadline with your team. Uh, I, it, it does give them a sense of where they are with the project. So if you just give me a project to do and don't give me any sense of when it's due or when you want to see a, a rough cut or something like that, I just put it off and put it off and put it off. So understand that deadlines do play a role. You don't want to have excessive criticism. You don't want to micromanage the project, but learn to give people deadlines. And the last thing I would say is, in a creative sense, understand that organizational structure at your church or your ministry or your nonprofit is different from communication structure. The secret, I think, to leading creative people is, you know, we need the organizational structure. I get that. We need the pastor or the president or the CEO. We need the vice president. We need the executive pastor. We need different levels of, of authority in an organization. I totally get that. However, don't let that become your communication structure. For instance, if a graphic designer is working on a new logo for the church, they shouldn't have to go through five layers of management to get to the pastor or get to the president or get to the CEO. Your communication structure at your organization needs to be much more free flowing. That's the only way to really make progress happen because otherwise you'll be waiting forever and every single person they have to present it to is gonna give them feedback and their ideas. Let me tell you, you need to be able to go to the source. So organizational structure is great. I encourage it, have a good one, but at the same time, that's not necessarily your communication structure. It should be much more open and much more free flowing. So those are just some things that I think are important about leading creative people. And I've done a podcast and a, and a, a YouTube episode on leading creative people. I'd encourage you to go into it for more detail um, and check it out because that's my first communication priority as a pastor, learn to inspire and lead creative people. Remember, they're the key to multiplying your message to potentially thousands or millions of people way beyond the walls of your church. The second communication priority I would have is our church website. And here's the thing to remember. Your church website should not be designed for church members. Think about it for a minute. Your church members know where the church is. They know who the pastor is. They know what time services start. They know when the big Christmas pageant's coming up. I can guarantee you that no church members in your church ever check your website. Your website should be designed for new visitors. I can also guarantee you that virtually 100% of new visitors will check you out online before they ever show up. So here's the thing. If your website is the tipping point, the thing that really decides whether people want to come and visit your church or not, you know, it sounds harsh, but your website ought to be about the best thing you do as a church because that's what's convincing people to come. So churches and ministry organizations we work with I encourage them, design it around the new visitor. What do they need to know that will give them a compelling desire to come and visit your church? I'll tell you, if you can do that, it will change everything. So I think that's really, really critically important. Give it the, you know, where the location of the church, why they need to come, what you believe, who the leaders are, those kind of things that are really focused on a visitor and makes them want to come. So totally stop thinking about your website in terms of your membership and start thinking about your website in terms of new visitors, because I can tell you, they're checking it out online. I find, by the way, along that line, uh, make it rock, make it rock visually, design wise. I'm just amazed that church websites are so lame when the truth is so many people will check you out at a church website before they decide to visit. So rethink it because it could be the most important thing you do. Number three, this is important too. Understand that your Sunday message is the point of the spear for all the communication channels that flow out from the church the following week. So our team at Cook Media Group, one of the greatest frustrations we encounter when we go in and work with a new church is very often the pastor will get in the pulpit on Sunday and preach a message on one subject. Well, the following week, social media is telling a completely different story. The video guys are telling a completely different story. 
the email blasts, the print materials, other things that go out are telling a completely different story. I'm telling you, it's like going into battle and your enemy is over there, but you're aiming all your guns in different directions. You're going to make no impact at all. You're going to get creamed out there in the battlefield. The churches that really break through, the churches that make a great impact are the ones that have aimed all their guns in the same direction. What does that mean? That means that once the pastor preaches that message, social media, they echo that message throughout the week. You, you don't have to repeat it verbatim or, or say the exact same phrases, but you're repeating that theme throughout the week. Your, your videos that you're shooting, your email, email blasts, what your social media, whatever. All of it is reflecting the message of the pastor. Now, Seth Godin, the marketing expert, is a friend of mine. He wrote a, wrote a great endorsement of one of my books. He just came out with a book uh, recently called This is Marketing. And uh, in, the, in the book, he says, repetition builds trust. Now, here's one thing as a communications person you, you probably face is that working on the inside of an organization, you hear the pastor's message, you hear the sermon branding, you hear themes over and over and over. And I get it. You Sometimes you think, man, if I have to hear that, that theme or that message one more time, I'll blow my brains out. I'll kill myself. But the truth is, when you're getting sick of the pastor's message or you're getting sick of the new advertising campaign or the theme, that's when the people outside the walls of the church is just starting to sink in with those people. So don't ever pull something simply because you get tired of it. And so aim all your guns in one direction. Make sure you're reflecting that theme. And if you do that over and over and over again in the following weeks, that's going to blow a big hole out there in the target. And that's going to make a much greater impact with your church. So understand that the Sunday message is really the point of the spear for everything your church communicates all week. The fourth thing I would say is you need to create a research and development lab in your church. Now, I know this sounds like a huge luxury and, and you'll probably think, well, only big churches can, can do something like this. But I, if I was a pastor, if I had 20 people in my congregation, I'd think about the R&D lab. The reason being is, how do you know? We don't know what works and what doesn't work. We're constantly faced with questions. The culture's changing. You know, the Bible says God's word never changes, but everything else sure does. Culture changes, people change, trends change. Everything is changing out there. So what is it that's going to work online? What is it that's going to work in social media? What is it that's going to work in video? We have to be constantly experimenting. One of the things that one of my great frustrations was I had a major, I was forced to have a major reinvention in my own career some time ago when I looked at my work. This is about 10 or 15 years ago. I looked at my work and one day realized, man, the videos that I'm doing are so dated. The television work that I'm doing, the film work I'm doing, it just looks dated in the style and the presentation. And I really had to step back. And I discovered that, you know what? That reflected a time when I had done really great work. I'd won some awards. I'd gotten some coverage in a national mag couple of national magazines. I'd, I'd really gotten some acclaim out there. And I've discovered since then, we often get stuck in a period where we've done actually really well. But the problem is we get stuck. We love that acclaim. We get stuck. So 10 years later, we're still shooting the same style of videos. 10 years later, we think the website design is still cool. 10 years later, we think the fundraising campaign we're doing still works while the rest of the world has left us in their wake. So understand that's so critically important. And, and we also, you know, it's just a matter of always to, trying to experiment with new things. I actually worked for a major ministry a number of years ago that during his watch, he was the donor development guy. And during his watch, the ministry had lost 65% of their income. They'd gone down 65% in their annual fundraising. And I said, look, at what point does the red flag go up? At what point do you realize maybe what we're doing isn't working? He said, no, 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 no. It worked in 1995. It should still be working today. It's not, it's not me. It's not my strategy. It's people have changed out there. And I said, yeah, they have changed. So we need to start changing our strategy to go along with it. So the only way that happens is if you create an environment where experimentation is okay. Now, this, this is tough for a pastor. I, I was with another ministry not long ago, and they said, we want dollar in, dollar out. And that meant for every dollar they spend on media and communication, they want to get a dollar donation back. I'm telling you, it sounds good, but it really doesn't work in real life because nobody can really keep up with that. We're going to try things that fail. We're going to try things that work gloriously, 
but you never know until you try. So I just say, if I was a pastor, number four would be starting an R&D lab in my church. And it could be volunteers. It can be one paid person, your communication director, or if you work at a big church or you have a big church, make a team of employees that their role is not to be held accountable for making money or growing the church immediately. Their role is what's going to happen in the future? What should we be experimenting with today that'll open the door for success tomorrow? And the fifth thing I'd say, my fifth communication priority if I were a pastor, is be ruthless about creating a team around you. I, I find that even in large churches, churches of thousands of people, the pastor is still largely carrying the ball. He's coming up with the messages. He's coming up with the branding. He's coming up with the taglines. He's coming up with themes. He's coming up with stuff for social media. It's just amazing that pastors carry an incredible burden. So if I was a pastor, one of my priorities would be, I want a writer, a researcher. I want a creative director. I want a graphic designer around me. I want people that will surround me that can feed me creative ideas. That doesn't take away anything from who I am as pastor. It doesn't take anything away from my credibility or my expertise or my calling, but it helps support me in the things that I can do to make a dramatic difference in the lives of people. So have those people around you. And it could come out of that R&D development team that we talked about maybe. But I find successful pastors out there who are really making an impact in their community have somebody helping them do the research, have someone helping them put together printed materials, even someone, someone that can take their sermon transcripts and maybe help rewrite those into a little mini book or a full length book, help them prepare creative content that will be used in so many more ways. So I, I just think it's really important that we look at all these things. So let's review. Number one, if I was a pastor, my five creative, my five communication priorities would be number one, learn to lead creative people. There's plenty of sources on my blog at philcook.com. There's plenty of sources and posts I've written on leading creative people. Just type it in the search box. You'll find a lot of resources. Learn to lead creative people. If you can inspire and motivate them, it'll make such a dramatic difference in the way you operate and the way your organization it really moves forward. The second thing would be understand that your website is not for church members. It's for new visitors. And trust me, when you think about that new visitor paradigm, you're thinking about an eight second world. I've talked about before that we live in a world where when you meet someone for the first time, you decide what you think of that person in the first four to eight seconds. We're being pulled in so many directions. We have so many distractions. We've learned to decide about things before we even know about them, which means the first impression of your website will matter. In fact, it's that way with every aspect of your church. I, I tell pastors all the time, I'm glad your message is anointed. I'm glad your worship is fantastic. But in an eight-second world, what's the parking experience like? What does your lobby look like? Who's the first person a new visitor meets when they walk in the door? The fact is, uh, you know, that the, the people make a whole lot of decisions before they ever get to their chair. In fact, we worked with one church in the Midwest that's identified seven distinct places where they can engage with a new visitor before they get to their chair. They want to make sure that visitor has a really positive experience. Now, in your church, seven visits or seven engagements may drive people nuts. So you have to think about your own personal situation. What would it take to make people feel a compelling reason to want to come back? And the, the bottom line for all, for all of that is that we live in an attention-driven culture. If we can't capture people's attention, I don't care how awesome we are, we have failed. So your church website should be focused around that eight-second world. It should immediately grab people's attention, and it should be focused on people who have never been to your church before. The third thing, understand your Sunday message is the point of the spear. When I get in that pulpit on Sunday, if I was a pastor, I don't want to make sure that theme, that subject was reflected in every communication platform from our church the following week. Number four, start the R&D lab, get it moving. An R&D lab can be so important for creative ideas. And if you're a creative person, pitch this to your pastor. Pitch this to your creative team. Pitch this to your elders. Pitch this to your board, church council, whatever. Because this is very important for you to have the freedom to try to experiment with new things that could reap an enormous harvest for your church. And then number five is be ruthless about positioning a team around you. As a pastor, you need to have a remarkable creative team. As I said before, I love missions, I love outreach, I love all kind of, you know, things the church does, but it's time to elevate that communication team. As we've seen in the, the COVID-19 era, 
it's time to really raise up that communication team because I don't care what your church did otherwise, your communication and media team is what kept your church alive during that shutdown. So remember, your communication team matters. Now, none of this is to minimize the importance of other things, preaching certainly, missions certainly, outreach, any of those things. However, I think we live in a time when we as professional communicators need to step up. If you work at a church or a ministry organization and you're a professional communicator, whatever you do, I would encourage you seize this moment. Thousands and thousands and thousands of pastors across this country and the world realize during the COVID-19 shutdown, my communication matters more than ever. So if you're ever gonna seize the moment and really help your pastor understand how to use media more effectively, this is the time. I'd love for you to really focus on how you can become the idea source for your pastor, help him elevate communication, and really move forward understanding we live in a digital generation and it's time to speak that language.